Welcome to The Debrief, Carolina Journal's weekly recap of major developments in North Carolina politics and public policy. I'm Mitch Kokai, sitting in for Donna King, and the reason is that Donna is on assignment this week at the southern border. Let's check in with Donna. What you see behind me is, uh, you know, the wall. We've talked a lot about it. It's been polarizing. There's about 140 miles of the wall through this region that is unfinished. So what they were telling us is that, first of all, they're getting about 2,000 uh, uh, migrants coming across a day. Uh, and, you know, of course, just in, in the U.S., we allow in about, about 2 million a year. They're getting 2,000 a day. This wall that you see behind me was actually started by George W. Bush. It was continued under the Obama administration. Uh, it was paused, and it was continued, of course, under Trump as well. It was paused under the Biden administration, and uh, Governor Abbott has continued it. Donna King at a border crossing in McAllen, Texas. Be sure to visit carolinajournal.com to see the full interview with Donna and to learn some of the things that she has learned during her trip to the border. Meanwhile, back home here in Raleigh, we're joined by a stellar cast of panelists. We're going to start uh, to my right here with some of the uh, experts that we have on staff. We have, of course, Alex Baltziger, who is the political reporter for Carolina Journal, talks a lot about the General Assembly, spends a lot of his time down there. And of course, uh, next week will be busy with the crossover week, which we'll be talking about on the show next week. Sitting next to him, the opinion editor at Carolina Journal, David Larson. If you enjoy the columns that you see at carolinajournal.com, you could thank David. He also has, as we will talk about a little bit later in the show, uh, always an outrageous story every week. Uh, looking on the other side now, uh, I say to my left, but they definitely aren't on the political left. We have uh, joining us Donald Bryson, who is the president and chief strategy officer of the John Locke Foundation and will, in the not too distant future, become the CEO. He's mm -hmm. going to be taking over That's from right. Amy O. Cook, the right AOC, in a matter of months. And joining us, uh, a rare appearance in front of the camera, Greg <laughs> DeDug, who is the creative director at the John Locke Foundation. And you'll learn in a little bit why we have Greg sitting in with us. We always enjoy Greg's company, but there's a special reason to have him because he is the producer of a special project the John Locke Foundation has been working on. Let's go ahead now and leap into the topics of the week. The first one, we're going to recap some of the things that have been happening at the General Assembly, another uh, eventful week at the General Assembly. And so let's bring in our legislative reporter, Alex Baltziger, to talk to us a little bit about some of the things that have been happening. Alex, what caught your attention this week? Yeah, so as you brought up in the introduction, crossover is next week. And so things have been moving at an especially rapid pace. I would say even more rapid than usual before crossover. Um, the Senate especially is moving uh, at lightning pace. <laughs> so we've, we've seen like a uh, double digit amount of bills in different committees um, and that's, that's fairly unusual. So things are moving very quickly. Uh, one of the first things this week that I, I actually wrote an article on was um, a nuclear bill, uh, which I thought was interesting because uh, we, we had a bill, House Bill 951, which sort of set the uh, picture for what our energy policy in the state is going to look like in the future. Um, and this bill sort of, uh, this new bill, um, it's a bill by Senator Paul Newton as the lead sponsor. Uh, he sort of opens the door for nuclear energy, takes down a few of the uh, technical restrictions, and uh, what it does is it defines clean energy uh, and removes uh, renewable energy. And so there's a, the, the distinction there is nuclear fits more under clean than renewable in a technical sense. Um, and then it also opens the door for fusion technology, which is something that's up and coming, and it defines it in statute as well. So I thought that was interesting. Um, there's a couple other, other interesting bills. There's a lot going on, but I'll, I'll be brief here. Uh, there's a bill to prevent harm to children, um, which is basically if, if you are distributing obscene material in front of children, uh, as it currently stands in law, there's no excess penalty for that, uh, but this bill would increase the penalty one level to make it a Class H felony instead of a Class I felony. Um, so I thought that one was a little bit interesting. Um, and then we've also, we've seen some ESG legislation. 
the House has a couple of bills that um, deal with ESG a little bit more in the private sector. Um, and then the Senate has an ESG bill that they're going to be moving forward with that touches on uh, not allowing ESG in the government space, so government investments. Um, and then the la last thing, and this is probably the most notable thing, uh, especially for all families in North Carolina, but school choice. Uh, we've been moving forward on that legislation. The House has introduced their version of the bill, and all 72 of the Republicans officially signed on last night. And right now we're seeing a still shot from a news conference that took place promoting these, the school choice legislation. Apparently a deal having been reached between the House and the Senate. You see Senator Michael Lee there at the lectern right behind him. The most recent convert. We've been talking about her for the last several shows. Trisha Cotham, formerly a Democrat, now a Republican, uh, even before she switched a major supporter of school choice. Alex, thanks for that update. I also want to bring in now because he has been working on school choice choice issues for a number of years and in fact earlier in his career worked for Parents for Educational Freedom in North Carolina and that's our own Donald Bryson. Donald, what do you think about this new development in school choice and ramping up opportunities for parents? It is uh, a monumental, it's a historic moment for school choice and education in North Carolina. Um, uh, the, the idea that we're going to sort of broaden the scope and, and almost universalize the Opportunity Scholarship Program is a really big deal because it makes uh, uh, education uh, options more accessible to more, actually all North Carolina families. Um, that's a, that, that has come at a very rapid pace when you think about the fact that uh, Milton Friedman was writing about vouchers in his Free to Choose book, what, back in the 1960s? Um, and then we went from there to homeschooling wasn't even legal in North Carolina until 1989. We didn't get charter schools until 1996. We didn't get the Opportunity Scholarship Program in its barest form until 2013. That's a long runway. And we've gone from 2011, we uncapped the number of charter schools we can have in the state. In 2013, we created a voucher program. And now we're going to uncap that as well. It's really a watershed moment for school choice, and I, I know that there are people on the left, and I, I imagine we'll talk about Governor Cooper here in a little bit, who uh, are opposed to this, and they want to talk about why this takes away money from public schools, but again, this is about funding students and not systems. It's about students. Let's talk about student outcomes, and let's stop talking about education as if it's a jobs program. Yeah, very important points, and I know uh, we've been talking about opportunity scholarships and school choice uh, over the past couple of uh, uh, shows, and I know, David Larson, you've been thinking about school choice and some of the important aspects of, of this policy. What have you been thinking about? Well, yeah, um, last, last time we met, we talked a little bit, or I did, about, you know, being a, a parent. I have two young children, and um, just kind of being able to have that freedom to pick a school that you think aligns with your values and kind of how you, how you want to raise your kids, but um, my high school boy self wouldn't forgive me if I didn't also bring up um, another big part of school choice is choosing schools where different types of people can flourish. And I think um, kind of some people call it the one size fits all model, but um, that, that idea where there's a lot of people, you know, the, the basic models were sending kids to sit in rooms in rows and learning. And I think boys especially don't always flourish in that. I, I was a very curious, eager to learn young kid. And then when I middle and high school, I was just, I kind of rebelled against that idea of just, being these little chairs in these little rooms, uh, it just wasn't fun to me. It wasn't something that one, you know, caused me to want to learn. So I think that's another exciting part of this is just creating ways for different types of kids to flourish and parents can see how their kids are doing and maybe we'll know them best and know maybe they would do better in this, this other kind. So that's, that's an exciting part about school choice and a voucher program that would allow maybe in the past, you know, wealthier families could see that an issue coming up with their kid and be able to afford another option, whereas lower income people were not able to. And so these, these kind of bills are exciting in that way. Yeah, school choice is going to be something I'm sure we're going to be talking about over and over again during the course of the weeks and months ahead. Another interesting issue dealing with education that was in front of a House Education Committee this week, and this is a, a bill called House Bill 605. It would call on public school units to set up school threat assessment teams. The idea is uh, we've heard about school shootings and some people saying, 
look, we knew there was a problem, but no one ever did anything about it. That is the reason behind this bill. Its sponsor is Representative John Torbett, Republican from Gaston County. Let's hear what he had to say about it. If we don't have anything like this, then currently students, uh, there's no way to tear the silos down of non-communication which means that if there's something going on with a child in today's world, there may be only one adult on a school property that comes in contact with that. And, and if they don't say anything about it, how often have you heard in the aftermath of some pretty serious events in our, in our nation's history relative to schools that, you know, we knew something was going on. Nobody said anything about it. We thought something odd or, or if we only knew this, my friends, honestly think in my heart of hearts could be the answer to the issues that we face when it comes to, uh, bad things happening in our school place about kids wanting to harm other kids or themselves. Yeah, important topic. And uh, Greg, uh, we know that you are also a parent of young kids. I'm, I'm sure school safety is something that's at least in the back of your mind as you're deciding what to do education-wise. Oh yeah, no, totally. And like when we like when we were choosing a school for our son, like that was one of the things we talked about was like with the schools is you know what do you guys plan to do if something bad happens, do you have any, you know, way to prevent this stuff, if that's possible, um, but, um, but I don't know, I think, I think from what the gentleman was saying, uh, it, it, it might be something valuable, I mean, because, I mean, when you really think about your community and your neighborhoods, like, you know, you know a lot, people know a lot more about what's going on with each other, you know, than they would say, right, if you think, like, somebody, you know, maybe you have a neighbor's kid, who is like a little off or something's wrong with them, you know, like what, what do you do if you suspect something? I mean, mm -hmm. you don't want to have people going around saying like, hey, I suspect somebody's kid is going to be, you know, a school shooter or something like that. But I mean, there should be some, we should encourage openness, I think, with, with discussions of mental health and everything like that, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see where this bill goes, uh, if, it, if it makes it past the finish line and uh, through the General Assembly and goes on to the governor. We're going to switch gears now and step a, a little bit away from Raleigh to look at an issue that's of national and international importance. And uh, of course, if you watch, read, listen to news, you're going to hear about the war in Ukraine. Well, this is something that prompted Donald recently to think, oh, you know, uh, there's an interesting twist on this, and he wrote a column that's going to be appearing in National Review that offers a very important history lesson. Donald, tell us about it. Sure. So uh, as of last month, uh, the United States has sent more than $30 billion worth of war material to Ukraine in aid of Ukraine uh, in this war of Russian aggression, whatever we, it is we want to call that. Uh, and that got me to thinking, uh, I always am fascinated by the years sort of 1933 to 1945. Um, obviously that was when the Second World War happened, but we talk a lot about economic systems and economic philosophies, but we got to see in that time frame how they interacted with each other in conflict and sort of what came out of that. Capitalism won, just just give everybody a spoiler <laughs> on how, how that worked out. We're watching the effects of it on the screen right, right but, now. But what was it about uh, the American economy that, that drove it? And so um, I wrote an article that'll be coming out in National Review uh, on Saturday that uh, looks at the case of Liberty Ships. Liberty Ships were a program that came uh, actually in the middle of 1941. Um, the first 200 were built in what was called the Long Range Shipbuilding Program that was replaced by uh, another government program, right, and called the Emergency Shipbuilding Program. But these liter Liberty ships were these very slow but very large cargo ships. Uh, they were the most widely built ship in World War II. Uh, the United States built 2,700 of them, which sounds remarkable in and of itself. But these ships could hold 14 and a half million gallons of fuel. They could ship 440 light tanks. They could fill. Uh, they could take enough sea rations on one to feed three million soldiers for one day. Uh, this is a lot of goods uh, or a lot of material being shipped across 3,000 miles of Atlantic Ocean, 6,000 miles of Pacific Ocean. Uh, and why was it that the United States was able to do that uniquely? What was it about the United States that had the unique value to be able to not only to produce these ships, but produce the material that could go into these ships? And as we're uh, drawing down on our current stockpiles and sending to Ukraine, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, what are we doing to refill those stockpiles? Are we, do we have an industrial plan to uh, supply Ukraine um, 
sustainably or are we going to continue to draw down on our stockpiles? What does that do about our readiness? And these are important questions that need to be answered uh, in terms of public policy at, at a national level. Yeah, and I'm sure we all look forward to reading at nationalreview.com the results of your work on that topic, an important history lesson. Anything that the other panelists would like to add? Is everyone uh, looking forward to reading what <laughs> Donald had to, had, to, had to say? Very impressed. Yeah, National Review, that's the uh, that's top magazine for, for conservative thinkers, so congratulations on that. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and a little plug for Wilmington, uh, only 18... Uh, cities had shipyards that built Liberty ships, including Wilmington, North Carolina, which I think produced about 125 of them. Well, good. So we have a good North Carolina right. tie into the story <laughs> as well. Well, uh, one of our favorite segments on uh, the, the, the new show, The Debrief, is the outrageous story of the week, which is something that David Larson writes about at Carolina Journal. You could see it every Friday at <coughs> carolinajournal.com. And now he talks about it when he appears here on The Debrief. So, David, tell us, uh, what is your outrageous story this time around? Yeah, so that's a, a segment that I, I inherited from my predecessor, Ray Notstein, and um, briefly didn't do it when I first started, and people complained, so we had to, <laughs> we had to bring that back quickly uh, for because you all love give that. Give the so, people what they want. Give them what they want. So this week, um, I chose a tweet from Governor Cooper. Um, it's up there now, so our tweet there. of the you week. Can, you can see that, but um, it is actually from after our show last week, so we'll, we'll count that as part of this week. As, sure. You know, and... He was reacting to the bill that, that Alex just spoke about a little bit, the Opportunity Scholarship Bill, but he said it was uh, worse than awful, that there's billions of dollars going to be spent and that billionaires' kids will be able to uh, get these vouchers. So I, I was curious a little bit, like, how many billionaires' kids are, <laughs> is this going to be a really big drain on our <laughs> North Carolina budget? So I looked that up, and uh, there's one source that said there's three, and another source that said there's four. Um, so I went with, just to be fair, I went with one that said four, and I looked up how many kids they have. And uh, Tim Sweeney, who's, uh, oh, there, there's that. So there's the results of my, my Google research. Uh, but basically no children of billionaires exist at the moment in North Carolina. Um, Although we would like that to happen. It would yeah. be nice for, to, <laughs> sure. to have some younger billionaires <laughs> pumping the, their money into the economy. So I think North Carolina's uh, you know, budget is safe from that. We don't have to tap into the rainy day fund to, to fix that. Um, but you know, maybe a billionaire with a brood of six will we'll move well, in soon. But. The, the ridiculous part of this is that Governor Cooper sent his kids to private school. And, and I'm not knocking him for doing that. I'm glad that he was able to have that choice and be able to afford it. That works out for rich white lawyers from Rocky Mount, right? Which is what he is. Uh, that that doesn't work out for every family in North Carolina, and other families in North Carolina have to make different financial decisions than rich white lawyers from Rocky Mount. Uh, I think it's a problem that he thinks that they shouldn't also have that type of access. Exactly, because they already have um, the option of sending their kids to public school, so it's not like we eliminate. You know, wealthy people aren't allowed to have access to public services like mm -hmm. that. Another. Uh, complaint I saw on this was that the money would go to uh, Christian schools where, you know, religion will be taught and, and government shouldn't be involved in that. But um, people who pay attention to the Supreme Court, uh, there's a, a case from Maine mm -hmm. that just wrapped up, um, I believe, last year. And that, that said, you know, if the money is available to people of all religious backgrounds, that does not violate the Establishment Clause. No particular re religion is being established if Muslim kids, which... Actually, that was the largest recipient of vouchers in North Carolina was the Islamic, uh, Greensboro Islamic Academy. Um, so uh, people of all religious backgrounds, and that's the parents' choice, you know, mm -hmm. if they want a Christian education or Islamic or secular, but at least in, in that, you know, there, it's pluralism, which is what America's about, people being able to make that choice. So that's kind of what I get into for that column. And um, yeah, so some people object to Christians and billionaires and all of that, but uh, you know, this really opens it up for people to have some choices in education. And you'll be able to read that column Friday at carolinajournal.com, and we hope you go to carolinajournal.com multiple times during the week and during the day to get the latest on North Carolina politics and public policy. I have to ask you, Alex, as someone who hangs out at the General Assembly, here's what people are saying. Uh, my guess is the governor's criticism of this bill is not really persuading any of the people who are moving forward on it. They, they don't buy this argument. That's right. And so, so 
before Republicans had supermajorities in both chambers, which was just a few weeks ago, they did not have supermajorities. Now they do because one of the Democrats switched over. Even before they had supermajorities, there were enough votes for school choice this year uh, in both of the chambers to override anything Governor Cooper was going to do. So even if he vetoes it, there were already enough votes. And now there are definitely enough votes. <laughs> We've already mentioned, uh, Greg, you uh, have a young son now in the school. I'm guessing that as a parent and with another one coming along who will be in school not too awfully <laughs> long, the idea of having this increased access to opportunity scholarships is something you'd like to see for everyone, yeah, not yeah. just for select groups. No, for everyone. And that's it's funny, just like um, a lot of people talk about that, is like how many kids do we have to have to qualify for opportunity scholarships? So people are all interested in it you know, when you, when you talk to the parents. And so um, there's, I, I, think, I think it's a great thing, too, because, I mean, when you think about it, if more people are choosing schools that aren't their district schools, I mean, hopefully what that'll do is, you know, s cause, like, the school districts themselves to say, like, hey, why, why does anybody want to come here? Maybe we can, you know, make our schools a little nicer so people do want to come here. And, you know, maybe they can get more funding that way. And I'm going to come right back to Greg in just a moment because our final segment of the show this week is going to give us a great opportunity to highlight some of the people that you don't see on camera. Uh, you're going to see Greg this time around. We've already been talking to him, but both Greg and Bill Caps, who works along with him, and Raf Siari as well were all mm -hmm. key pieces of something that the John Locke Foundation has been involved in called In the Pines. Greg, tell us what is In the Pines. Yeah, so that's the short film we produced last year. We just finished it uh, a few weeks ago, and we've already submitted it to film festivals, and it's won multiple awards, and we're going to do Internationally. Our... Internationally. Internationally, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've actually won awards in uh, from Kansas to, uh, to Bodrum in Turkey, um, and Amsterdam, I think. We yeah. won an award there, too. Um, everybody loves it so far, it's, it, and it, it, it happened just um, kind of randomly, and when we were trying to think of ways to get everybody more excited about North Carolina history and People tell are watching right now some of the, some oh, of the shots yeah. of the production. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's, um, that's actually behind the scenes photos that we took there. It's, uh, the, it's the story uh, basically um, of, uh, of some young kids caught in uh, some turbulent times in the turn of the century North Carolina. Um, after 1896, the Democrat Party um, you know, who was largely in control of the state of North Carolina since the Re Reconstruction and the Civil War, they, they lost power briefly to uh, a union of black North Carolinians, Republicans, and uh, sort of populist farmers. And, the, the, and this is something that is pretty astounding when you hear about it, but the Democratic Party's response to losing power to this uh, conglomerate, uh, conglomeration of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, different parties um, was to divide them, um, and their plan to divide these, this, this, this threat um, was to create what they called their campaign of white supremacy, and that was a uh, sophisticated um, propaganda campaign. There was lots of violence. It was, it was pretty intense, and the, the goal of it was to divide these people and win back the election in 1898, which they did, and um, successfully. Um, but there's uh, so many, like, crazy stories in that time, especially in Wilmington, um, North Carolina, which was the most prosperous uh, city in North Carolina at the time. It was a giant tr uh, 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 port, and they had multiple levels of trade going on there and industries, and it was multiracial. It was, there were black and white North Carolinians in positions of power. Everybody largely got along, and it was hugely successful town, like a, a big prize. And the only thing, um, uh, that the Democrats didn't have when they won the statewide election in 1898 was control of the city of Wilmington. And rather than you'd wait for, you know, the next off-year elections, they actually organized a coup, a literal coup, um, went in with weapons and uh, took out the, the, the Board of Aldermen of Wilmington um, and placed their own people. So they had total control after that. And your film doesn't really go into documentary style, but it's no. set, it is a fictional story set in that time. Yeah, frame. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, the story, there's so many good documentaries. Wilmington on Fire is one of them you can go check out. Um, so many documentaries have been made on this topic. Um, and we felt that the, a better way to kind of get 
people interested in the history of North Carolina and more awareness of some of the darker stuff that nobody talks about was to kind of place it in the background and just tell a, a story of, of these kids who basically grew up in a town uh, that was harmonious, peaceful, and then suddenly their whole world gets uh, uh, thrown off balance um, with the violence and the propaganda campaign. And I understand that in addition to the slides we've seen, uh, we're going to give people a little peek. Yeah, I think we've got a, uh, the trailer, if we can cue that up. When we are tired, we are attacked by ideas we conquered long ago. Ashley was a real Southern lady, kind and brave. Sam was one of us, but we lost the election that day. Acock believed in his bones that blacks would always be inferior to whites, that it was his racial duty to educate us. My father's paper was the only black daily in all the nation. He was the only one standing up to the Democrats and their lies. There's one more thing I gotta do. Oh, you promised we would leave today, Sam. We waited until the election was over, and it's over, Sam. Well, what are we going to do? The Democrats violently overthrew a sitting government. Hundreds of black people were slaughtered. Can you say that again? Only this time use the word white supremacists. And a big event coming up this week. Yeah, Friday night we're going to have a, a, a premiere event. I think if anybody's watching and, and they're interested in seeing it on Friday night, um, just to go ahead and you know message us or something like that, we might have some seats left. It's a private event, um, but we, we could get in some of your viewers uh, if they're interested. Mm -hmm. Donald, I have to ask you, as mm -hmm. the president of the John Locke Foundation, this is a new venture for, uh, for Locke being involved in a short film. What do you think about this? Uh, it, it is new. We're, you know, uh, Locke has uh, traditionally been a classic ivory tower sort of think tank with, you know, white papers and big ideas from on high, which are, which are incredibly important to public policy. It's also important to tell the story of history uh, and to tell the story of liberty. And, and that's not just victorious stories such as the John Adams series and the signing of the Declaration or Washington crossing the Delaware. There's also a tragedy involved. Uh, in the 1898 Wilmington riot and all the events surrounding that um, uh, are a tragedy and it led to a, a century of bad or more than a century of bad policy in North Carolina. How did we get there and this was about power politics. I don't think this will be the last sort of artistic endeavor that we put up with the John Locke Foundation. We're happy to, to try new things and tell this story a different way. I think it's very important. Well, it looks very exciting from the trailer. I'm going to uh, shift to the other couch. David, Alex, are you both looking forward to seeing this film? Oh, yeah. My, my wife and I are going to that premiere, so we're, we're excited to do that. And, uh, yeah, I think the, the story is not one that a lot of people know about. You know, a lot of people have moved to North Carolina from other states, and maybe when they're growing up, learned about something else, you know. But so it's, I think, it, you know, going back to what we talked about, opportunity scholarships, you know, it's, it's an example of if somebody tries to crush pluralism with, with government, it's kind of what they were trying to do. They didn't want a bunch of different communities all contributing. They wanted their supremacy of the way to use government to enforce their ideology and their oh, yeah. group. So, yeah, that, that happens throughout history when one group uses government as a tool like that. So I think it's a good a yeah. broader lesson that we can take as well. So it gives people context for all of the stuff that the John Locke Foundation is trying to do. Is like, you know, we live in pretty prosperous, great times right now, but it really necessarily wasn't always like that, and it might not always be. And mm. so the, the history is important. Alex, you're going to take a break from the General Assembly and check out this film? Absolutely. I'm very <laughs> much looking forward to it. A huge shout out to Greg, Ralph, and Bill for putting it together. Yeah, excellent stuff. And if you're not going to be able to take part in this week's premiere, you will have opportunities in the coming weeks and months to watch this new short film, In the Pines. Stay tuned to johnlock.org and carolinajournal.com for details. Well, that's all the time that we have for this week's program. We certainly thank you for watching, and we hope that you will join us again next week for another edition of The Debrief. Thank you.